The scripture today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until the, after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. For all the buyers. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I've had some questions about Russ, so I'm going to let y'all know that he will be back next week, and then he has some different times off, so he's taking his paternity leave in break, so he will be back next week. Just wanted you to know that. But today is a special day on the church calendar. This is Transfiguration Sunday. It's the Sunday, the last Sunday before Lent. And we will recall Christ's transfiguration that Molly read for us on the mountain with Elijah and Moses. So we're moving from the infant Jesus of Christmas and Epiphany towards the end of Jesus' life. And the transfiguration is one of the five milestones of Jesus' life, along with his baptism, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. We commemorate this day because this event changed Jesus. Shortly after this, Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem. He heads to Jerusalem to fulfill his destiny of his crucifixion, and his resurrection. So, Lent is right around the corner. And I hope you'll all plan to come this coming Wednesday night, right here at 6.30, for our Ash Wednesday worship. And Ash Wednesday is the first day of Lent. It's a season of 40 days, not counting Sundays. And Lent began as a time of fasting and preparation for baptism by converts to Christianity. It then became a time of repentance for all Christians. In the story that we heard, Jesus takes his three best friends up a high mountain, and he had recently told them that if they wanted to be his followers, that they had to deny themselves, take up their cross, to follow him. Peter, James, and John get to witness their friend and teacher change right before their eyes. His face was shining like the sun. His clothes were dazzling white. And Moses and Elijah come out of nowhere and God acknowledges Jesus as his beloved son. And then God tells the disciples to listen to Jesus. Now, can you imagine what the disciples were experiencing? Jesus stands before them, transfigured. And he was speaking to two prophets of old, and the disciples had no idea what was going on. Now, Peter was known for knee-jerk reactions, and he had one again by offering to build some booths because he didn't know how to handle what was transpiring. Peter needed to be reminded to listen. And when God spoke, he did listen. 
Sometimes we need to be reminded to listen to God too. I mean, purposefully listen. We need to stop for a while and be silent and pay attention to Jesus. Now, I know silence can be uncomfortable for some of us, but if we don't stop, all the constant noise and input will never be able to hear what God is trying to tell us. What do you think God might be trying to tell us right now? If only we'd listen. After the transfiguration, the difference in Jesus can't be missed by the disciples. And we see and understand Jesus differently as we read further into the story, into this gospel. We know Jesus is the one who came to fulfill God's promises. And seeing Jesus differently might help us to see other people differently too. If we look at others purposefully through the lens of love, we are able to see God in them. And don't you think we need some of that right now in this era of snap judgment that people make just because of others' beliefs? Wouldn't it be great if we all took a look at others and each other and saw them as children of God? It's easier to see the positive about someone when we see them as Jesus does. We've all probably known moments of surprised enlightenment when, through an ordinary act, someone we thought we knew pretty well is suddenly revealed to us in a brand new way. We can have conversations or encounters with people that we didn't understand at the time. But then in light of things that have happened, we can perceive them differently. We can even look back in retrospect on a loved one we've lost and realize that we missed the depth of meaning that person held in our lives while they were still with us. The glory of Jesus just beams through this story. And glory is a great descriptive word for God. Peter is so overwhelmed by the power and magnificence of the moment that he scrambles just to do something. He was trying to preserve that experience that was happening instead of just receiving it. Peter was thrown off by the majesty of the Lord. When have you ever seen something majestic? Where have you seen the glory of God radiating in your life? Do you see God's majesty when you stand at the edge of the ocean on the beach? Do you see God's majesty in the birth of a newborn baby? God's glory and majesty is all around us. And we can spot it in acts of love and devotion and kindness and patience. Glory can be seen in the face of someone we know or even in the face of a stranger. Just think, the early Christians saw God's glory and majesty in Jesus crucified and hanging on a cross. <coughs> on the mountaintop, the disciples fell to the ground and they were overcome by the fear at the sound of God's voice. Can't you imagine what they are seeing is beyond anything that they have ever experienced before? Jesus had told them that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. But they didn't get it. Peter and James and John wanted to build this safe sanctuary away from everything else. They wanted to save Jesus and themselves from the agony and suffering to come. But they couldn't stop the suffering they were headed for. And we can't stop the suffering in our lives either. We know the story only too well of what Jesus suffered. 
And we all endure pain and suffering in our lives. The child who is sick, the relationship that's beyond repair, the family member struggling with substance abuse. How many nights do we go home and turn on the news to see nothing but chaos? But then, at the end, there might be a story that tugs at the heart about the grace that one person offered to another. And how many of us have been through storms and hurricanes, but once the storm is over, we all come together and help anybody that needs it. These are the moments that we realize that God is with us through the chaos, through the suffering, through the storms, through the hurricanes, just as God is with us in the triumphs and successes of our life. The transfiguration is the moment at which God says to us that there is nothing we can do to prepare for or avoid sorrow in this life. We can't escape God's grace and joy either. God will find us at church, at school, at home, <coughs> on the job, anywhere. And on the mountaintop, Jesus touched the disciples and told them to not be afraid. But they can't remain on the mountaintop. They have to follow Jesus down into the valley. And I believe that as the disciples descended the mountain, they were still very fearful. Yet, Jesus accompanies them down the mountain. Whatever things we face, the fear of the mountaintop or the fear of the valley, God is always with us. Remember that Jesus had told the disciples to deny themselves and take up the cross and follow him. So, just like climbing up that mountain, Lent will be work. I challenge you to practice self-examination during the season of Lent. And instead of giving something up, maybe try taking something on that allows you to spend some silent time with God. <coughs> Spiritual practices of prayer, reading scripture, just sitting in silence and listening for God's voice, those are great things to do during Lent. The requirement of the cross on Good Friday weighs heavily upon us as we take a hard look at ourselves, face our sin, and return and repent. I pray on this Transfiguration Sunday that you feel the presence of Christ on your journey through Lent. And I pray that you feel the presence of Christ on your journey up and down the mountain. Amen. <coughs> I will pray. I'll do that in the first service. Precious God, we thank you for this season of Lent that is before us. And we ask you to help us during this time examine ourselves and turn away from the things we need to turn from. God, be with this church and help us as we face Lent and the work of it. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen.